Um, good afternoon, guys. Here's Tim Five to present our first paper in the in this class titled "Glide Towards Photorealistic Image Generation and Editing with Text Guide Diffusion Models." This is the outline of the presentation, and this is a snapshot of the image that we are going to discuss and uh, illustrate in this presentation. And here is a GitHub repository link to the work of this paper. Let's start with uh, some motivation. So the future models have revolutionized generating photorealistic images from text prompts. So here is an example of a hedgehog using a calculator. You can see how realistic the image, uh, generated image is that the hedgehog is pressing the buttons of the calculator and is looking at the LCD screen of the calculator. Another example of a painting of a fox in the style of Stereo Night. You can see how the diffusion model was able to generate an image that mimics the same style of the Stereo Night painting by Van Gogh. Also, one of the interesting applications of diffusion models is image editing or image embedding, which is making realistic edits to an image based on natural language prompts. So here is a generated an image of a landscape. We will select a certain region of the image and then given a text prompt of zebra roaming in the field, the diffusion model can make it a student image keeping the same uh, style of the original image. So in this paper, there are two main objectives. The first one is to develop Gali diffusion model to generate photorealistic images given text prompts using two ways. The first one is clip guidance. The second way is using classify free guidance. We will straight uh, discuss more about these two ways. The second main objective of this paper is performing image embedding or image editing. Okay, let us have a quick overview over uh, diffusion models. So the future model, as we already know, and Dr. Shah illustrated in the previous classes, we have two processes. The first one is the forward process, and the uh, second stage or the second process is the backward process. So in the forward uh, process, we want to add noise to the image until it is a complete, a complete noise, and then denoise the image till we go back to the original image. Now let us talk more about the forward process. So we will successively adding the noise uh, to the original image and generate samples until the image is complete noise. And then we will do the uh, backward process. Adding the noise will be based on the Gaussian distribution. So given xt minus one, we want to generate xt. And now the backward process. When here is the main part of the future model, the inference itself where there is training. So now we have a complete noise image and we want to denoise the image until we have this clear image. So given xt, we want to generate xt minus. So a neural network model will be trained to estimate the mean vector and covariance vectors is on the Gaussian distribution to be able to denoise the image until we have the, uh, until the image is completely denoised. But so far, this is, we can say, unguided diffusion model, and we want to make it more controlled to have a more photorealistic images. And now Mohammed will take more, uh, will talk more about how we can control it and deep more uh, into text guided diffusion model. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, all of you know what uh, diffusion is. So, you know, it was, uh, it is a distribution that you, uh, for which the mean you learn and the standard deviation or the variance you learn. And what you do is you pass a noisy image XT and, you know, successively denoise it to generate a realistic image. But the problem with that, and you already understand that, right? So the problem with that is, you know, you are giving just a random noise and generating a realistic looking image, uh, but you're not controlling it. So you just give some random noise and it generates a random realistic looking image. So what you want is you want more control. Okay, so something like a label, uh, something like a goldfinch and you want to denoise the image. So it generates uh, this species of the birds or, you know, the label can be even more, you know, detailed. You want something detailed in your scene. So robots meditating in Vipassana retreat to generate this. So your problem is essentially changed, right? So previously you were generating uh, 
you were generating xt minus one given xt, but now you are generating xt minus one given xt with some condition, and that condition is text, and that's why we call it a uh, text conditioned diffusion model. Okay, so this condition is essentially changed, and your problem is now different. So uh, you know, let's we can what we can do is you know, given this uh, you know uh, mathematical approach, what we can do is okay, let's train a uh, diffusion model with something very simple. So something like you pass this label to this transformer, get an embedding and use this embedding with, along with your noisy image to generate a lesser and lesser noisy image. And this works, but the problem with that is, you know, this naive text conditioning is not going to give you very coherent samples with your labels, okay? So the label that you passed, uh, you know, the image that will be generated will not have the exact context that you want, okay? so. The pro this is the problem and the solution to that is guidance. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about guidance, what guidance is. So, you know, this was your initial distribution, right? So, uh, and what it was doing is you were passing some noisy image to this diffusion model and you were getting some mean and some variance and you were forming a normal distribution out of that. And then you were sampling some image out of that and that was a lesser noisy image, okay? So what guidance does is, you know, it changes this mean. So previously, let's say your distribution was here and its mean was, you know, something like mu theta. Theta is actually the parameters of your diffusion model. So you, that's that. And what you want is you want to shift this mean by something, okay? So there is some guiding parameter here that you add to this mean to generate a new mean so that one sample from that you get something that is lesser noisy, less is, is a lesser noisy image, but also have the uh, text condition that you have uh, to it. So that's what called guidance. And this something, this parameter, this guidance parameter is what we are looking for. So let's start with something very simple, you know, and that is your classifier based guidance, okay? And this classifier based guidance means that the label that you give is just class label and you want to generate the image that, that belongs to this class label. So what you do is first of all, you train a classifier. And what this classifier does is if you pass a noisy image XT to it, it gives you a label for that. And this classifier should be robust enough so that when you pass this noisy image, because we are working with noisy images, right? This diffusion models in, in many steps, we have a noisy image and you know this classifier should be robust enough to give us a very uh, good label for that. And Okay, so once we have this trained classifier, then what we can do in diffusion, uh, what you do is you pass this noisy image through this classifier, get this label Y, and then compute the gradient of log probability of Y with respect to XT, okay? So you compute the gradient of this label with respect to XT, and that is mathematically represented like that, okay? So this is our guidance parameter, that the, what, the something that we were talking about. So previously the distribution was here, now this mean is shifted, okay? So previously this mean was, you know, only conditioned on XT. Now it is conditioned on XT and Y, but with some guidance parameter. So this is the guidance parameter. This is something that we were talking about, okay? So this is added to your mean and it is multiplied with some scale factor as well. So you can control like how much guidance you want. And this is your simple classifier based guidance. But the problem with this is of course, you know, you are just giving one class label. What if you want, a more detailed scene in your image, something like robots meditating in Vipassana retreat as we discussed earlier, right? So what you, we can do is we train a more robust uh, guidance model and use that. So something like clip-based guidance, okay? So what we do is we do train a clip model and you all know what clip model is. Dr. Shah has already explained it very well, but let me just, you know, recap it. So everything is fresh for you. So we have, you know, a text encoder and, Im and, Im and image encoder, and we pass our text batch to this text en encoder and get some text embeddings. And we pass our images encode, uh, images batch to this image encoder and get our uh, image embeddings. And what we are really looking for is some sort of, uh, you know, uh, this uh, score metrics. So once we multiply, uh, once we like take the dot product of these two vectors, the uh, the image embedding vector and the text embedding vector and we get the highest you know uh, score there and once if we you know uh, take the dot product of this image vector with any other uh, text vector the the score should be very low okay and how we do that is using by optimizing this loss function 
And this looks a little bit mathematical. Let me just you know explain what this is. So I use your image vector, of course, this image embedding vector. Okay, so this is hyperdimensional vector, and you have a text embedding vector as well. And what you want to do is you want to reduce the cosine similarity between uh, them. So the so, so sorry, you want to increase the cosine similarity between them. And what do I mean by this cosine similarity? is something like this. So although these uh, image embedding and text embedding are hyperdimensional vector, but for simplicity purposes, just consider these are two dimensional vectors, okay? And we can plot them on a 2D plane, uh, 2D plane something like that, okay? So we have the image vector here and we have a text vector here. And what we want is we want to lessen the angle between them. So this theta, you know, we want it to be zero. So these vectors, are parallel and that is what we call what we call the cosine similarity okay so the cosine similarity is very high if your angle is zero okay and it, it's it as your angle is increasing then the cosine similarity lessens and then we have you know other parameters something this sigma function to just control the output between zero and one and we have cross entropy loss okay so that is you know a quick recap of what clip was so the purpose of the clip is to increase, maximize everything along this diagonal and minimize everything anywhere, everywhere else. Okay, so now you know that. So you have this train, uh, you train this clip model. And once you have that, what, what you do in diffusion is you pass your noisy image through this image encoder and get your image embedding and pass your uh, text to this text encoder and get your text embedding. And what you do is you take the dot product between them. So this is your score. Okay, so this dot product is essentially uh, what we have already seen here. Okay, so uh, you have this score now. And what you do is you compute the gradient of this score with respect to the noisy image. And if we mathematically represent it, it's something like that. Okay, so the gradient of this score with respect to the XT image, the noisy image that we had. So now your distribution is changed. Uh, so, you know, previously this distribution was the XT minus one given XT. Now this mean that we want to shift is now shifted with this guidance parameter that we just calculated multiplied with some scale factor again. So you see now the similarity, okay? So this is just a different guidance parameter here with clip based models. But the problem with both of these models uh, is that, you know, you have, uh, you, you are relying on a smaller, you know, model guidance model because of oftentimes your diffusion model, the bigger model that is generating the image is very big model. And these pre-trained classifiers or, you know, these clip models are usually smaller than that. And they create a bottleneck because your bigger model is now relying on the results of a smaller model. So what you want is something where we say classified free guidance, okay? Something like a, a guidance technique where we do not need a pre-trained classifier. And how do we do that? So let's talk about that. So previously what we were doing, we were doing we were training a guidance model first, but now we are saying that we don't want that. So there is no separate guidance model needed. Then what we do, we do what we do is we train a naive text conditional model. But in one of my previous slides, we have already established that this naive text conditioning is not going to give you very coherent results. So what is the trick here? I mean, uh, you are passing these noisy images and this label Y to train it. There is nothing changed, right? So what, what is the trick here? The trick is during training, Sometimes you don't pass the label. You set your label to null. And this forces your diffusion model to learn uh, realism, gener generating, you know, it, it learns to generate realism in photos. Why is that? Because, you know, now you have, you remove this text condition. And this happens sometimes. So sometimes you pass the label and sometimes you don't pass the label. So your neuro diffusion models, model learn to generate both the images with Y and without Y, okay? so. Once you have that, okay, so you trained your diffusion model, then at inference time, what you do is you have this diffusion model. So you generate one distribution, one mean. So this is the mean of that distribution, right? So you generate one mean using the your, your noisy image and without passing any text, okay? So a null text. And you repeat this process, but now you pass the Y label as well. So now you have two distribution. One distribution is with the text and the other one is without, uh, one is without the text and one with the text, okay? And what you do is you try to move your prediction or you try to move your mean uh, of your distribution from this uh, distribution without the text toward a distribution with the text. And let me show you graphically what that means. 
Okay, so this was your uh, mean without the text, and this is plotted here is in, in in red dot. Okay, so this distribution is generated without the text, and then you have another distribution with the text. And what you want is you want to move from this red dot to this blue dot, and this is essentially a vector, right? So you can just subtract that here, as you can see here. You can subtract this from that, and you will get this vector. Okay, and this vector is then multiplied with some scale. So it can be one. So then the length of this vector will be exactly the distance between these two distributions, or it can be more than one. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about this S because we're talking about the scale parameter too much. And this, uh, you know, affects your output a lot. So that's why I want to talk a little bit more about this S. So we let's suppose we have a label where we say a stained glass window of a panda eating bamboo, and we want to generate images on that. So if you will set S equals to zero, that means you are not introducing any sort of guidance. Okay. So now uh, your model is not using this text prompt you know very much because in some of the steps you will you will not be using uh, you know the the values of your text label and s is already very small so it will generate i mean a panda and you know a, a, a glass window sometime but you will see that it's not very first of all photorealistic and in all of the images that it generates uh, this condition is not met in all of them so for example in the second image there is no stained glass okay so but what you can see is that there is a lot of diversity. Okay, so your background colors, you know, the scenario is very different when S is equal to zero. And when you set S equals to three, that means you are saying that I really, really need everything, whatever I have in this text prompt to be in my, uh, you know, in, in the final output images. So you get very nice looking realistic images, you know, and all of them have, uh, you know, a stained glass in the background and a panda eating bamboo in the front. But what you see here, the problem that arises here is that, uh, you know, now you do not have any diversity. So you can see like in all of the images, the green color is kind of very apparent. And, you know, all of these images have a same style. So there is no diversity, but as when S was zero, there was more diversity. So this is all about guidance. Now I will pass to Chandra, who will talk about, you know, uh, sorry, I will pass uh, to Joseph, who will talk about the matrices first, and then Chandra will explain, you know, uh, how those matrices were used to compute the results. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> sorry about that, I was muted. Okay, uh, before we get into uh, talking about the uh, results, let's talk about a few metrics, metrics that they use, uh, specifically the more, the less intuitive ones, um, the inception score and the uh, virtual inception distance, or FID. So first, we'll talk about the inception score. Uh, this is named after the inception model that's used in this process. Uh, all that matters for the purposes of this discussion is that it's a type of classifier model. The purpose of the inception score is to give a way to evaluate samples without humans. When you're generating images, it lends itself very well to human about human evaluation. However, the problem with that is it's not always convenient. So this gives a more automatic way to do something that still correlates well with human evaluation. As far as calculating the uh, inception score, uh, the inception model is ran on the generate on the model on the images generated by the diffusion model. And from that, we get P of Y given X, which is just um, the statistical way to say it's the distribution of labels um, for a given image that's generated by the model. So this tells us how, dis how distinct this uh, image is that corresponds to how well it corresponds to other labels. Um, and we also get P of Y, which is distribution of labels across all images. And then we get the relative entropy, which is just a statistical difference um, metric uh, between both P of Y given X and P of Y. And what this uh, does in English is it measures how distinct the, uh, the images are that are generated by the model, as well as how varied the images are. Now, the higher the inception score, the better the model. And the higher these two values are, the higher the inception score. And I'll show the math of that on this next slide here. So here's the formula. Uh, here, E of X is, give, is the expected value. This allows us to go through all of the images that are 
generated by the diffusion model. PFL is that relative entropy metric that I was telling you about before. And then P of Y given X and P of Y also was talking about before, uh, measuring our, how distinct it is and how uh, varied the samples generated are. Now, one issue with the inception score is that it is isn't trained on real world samples. It's only it's only trained on generated samples. So FID was created to sort of uh, address this drawback. So to calculate FID, um, again, the inception model is ran on the fake images, but it's also ran on real life images as well. And then once you have those two, those two will result in two Gaussian distributions, um, and then your FID score is a is the difference between the two resulting Gaussians, the real and the um, generated image. And for this, the lower the score, the better, and that will be talked about more with uh, Chandra. Uh, and here is that distribution. This one right here is the uh, distribution of the in of inception ran on the real life images. Here is the distribution of um, inception around the generated images. TR is just a trace thing. This all looks complicated, but this is just a way to, um, like I was saying before, this is just running, this is just getting the difference of two uh, Gaussians, two distributions. Um, and it's a little complicated because of how the math works out. But that is the inset that is inception score and FID score. And so I'll hand it over now to Chandra to talk about uh, how the testing is done and how these two scores um, are seen with the, uh, in this specific uh, GLIDE instances. Hey, can you guys see my screen? Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the setup, like how is the experimental setup and how is the training being done and all those uh, things. So here's the model that, as you can see, it is a model that we, that we have here. And then this model, we have a white, we have three different models. We have the white and we have the text uh, model. So the text model has the uh, pixel of 65 by 65, 65 by 4 by 64 pixel. And the white also has the uh, 64 by 64 pixel. And then we have the upsampling network. To produce the higher resolution, we have the upsampling network. Which is done by increasing the increasing the band, increasing the size to increasing the layers, increasing the size to one five hundred tall, and then we can from there we can uh, we this is the upsampling we have, and from there we can calculate the batch size of the upsampling as well as the, given the batch size of the uh, of the water and text model is two thousand forty eight, and we can calculate the batch size of the upsampling block being five hundred tall, which is two thousand forty eight uh, divided by eight four, which is five hundred tall. The data set that we use is going to be the MS Coco images and we're using the MS Coco images and the textual prompts from the MS Coco uh, data set as well. So evaluation, I just want to talk to you about how, how, how is it being evaluated? Is it's, it's a FID versus inception, uh, FID versus inception score. So we can see, so this is the graph that, that we have. So from the, from the graph, it can be seen that, uh, the class five free guidance perform better than the clip guidance. So I'm going to explain how, because we, we want to have it where the FID is low and we have want to have the higher inception score. For the class five free, the inception score is 23. And then we have uh, we have 19 for the uh, inception score for the class, uh, for the clip guidance. So this shows uh, shows that the class five free guidance perform better in terms of the inception score. Additionally, we have the FID, the analyzing the FID, the MS Coco FID. Uh, we, see, we see that, uh, that the class five free guidance ha ha is better because it has lower FID than compared to a uh, clip model. The uh, par line parallel to the y axis from that we can see it being great place. And also, the area under the curve, there's a more, uh, the area under the curve is more for uh, more for the uh, class five free guidance than compared to the clip guidance in terms of the gradient. So, this we can see how, uh, how that. Uh, how class five free guidance perform better than the clip guidance. So I'm going to show the table, which shows the, the values. The, so the, as I mentioned, batch pattern is low FID and high inception score. This is the values that we got, the, power, the values that we got from, uh, the, this is the inception score, uh, the FID, FID values that we received for different uh, models. So we can see that from this, I mean, the, this, the GAN models that we see here, we just use a pointer. Uh, 
So yeah, let, I'm sorry for not, I'm not having laser pointer here. From laser pointer, we, I'm, I'm using laser pointer just to show you this. So in the GAN models that we have here, GAN and the LFI mod models. So we were trained using it was trained using FID, and here are the outcomes produced. And for the DALI, LFI didn't glide with the validation filtered, right? We got the zero shot FID being present. So what is uh, this had zero shot FID? This these GAN models never use the zero shot. So what does the zero shot FID mean? Zero shot FID, it's basically, it's calculated from the samples. Like the score is calculated from samples that were observed from the classes, which were not observed during, which were not observed uh, during the training, during the training uh, period. So basically just trying to calculate the scores from the classes that were not used in the training period. So from this table, it can be seen that uh, the zero shot FID improved the performance so with Glide and uh, with Glide and validation filter, the performance is, uh, is 12 with the LFID out 26. So we can see that the glide performed better, better, better than uh, what LFID has done with zero shot FID included in it. And zero shot FID included the glide performed better than uh, uh, DM GAN and GAN other GAN models here. So I want to talk about how ELO scores are completed. This is a, the equation for the ELO score. This is the equation for the ELO score here. So equation ELO scores. So the main idea of computing ELO scores is you want to minimize the ob minimize the objective basically. So way we compute ELO scores, we can we construct a matrix matrix A, right? Cons given that we have the two models I and J, we want to figure out how many times did uh, did uh, model I uh, I uh, I per beat how bet uh, model J in terms of the relative performance and we're trying to compute the difference of the of the performance between model i and j and how many times it bet it it be, uh, performed better model i performed better than model j so that's how we compute the that's the idea behind computing uh elo score and we try to want to minimize the loss as well so elo score guidance scales i just want to talk to you about for some data with the elo score guidance so again, yeah, as I said, it's a metric that measures the relative performance in zero shot uh, learning. So it measures the probability of the uh, success or probability of the perf or relative performance success in uh, zero shot learning. So we have the two things shown here. We have the class, we have the classifier of free guidance and clip guidance, guidance shown for photorealism. The photorealism, the average scale is uh, 3.0. And from this, we can see that the, uh, the, the ELO quality is higher for class five free guidance than uh, is higher for class of free guidance in the clip uh, guidance here. So, I mean, uh, so how is photorealism me measured? The quality is measured in terms of the visual images that are being produced, in terms of the brightness, in terms of how blurry it is, in terms of uh, brightness, in terms of the, uh, like how clear are the images is what we are trying to, how realistic and how clear are the images produced is what photorealism uh, measures. So we have the similar similar for the caption uh, similarity as well. The relative caption, which we got uh, the caption similarity, which is, I mean, so the caption similarity also a relative ELO score for caption score. And from this, we can see that the classifier free guidance over outperformed uh, the clip guidance and clip guidance because the relative score for caption similarity is is uh, is higher, is higher for, uh, is higher for the class five free guidance than compared to clip guidance. So caption similarity, it's, me it's measured how to, what does caption similarity mean? So it's measuring like how similar are the, is the text produced to the images. That's what the caption uh, similarity is, is measuring. So I want to talk about uh, the values that we got here. So we have the unguided and clip guidance and the class five free guidance. And uh, Mohammed Shabazz may have explained what does these things, what's the difference between those things. So I'm just going to get into the details here. So we, so when adding the club guidance, right, unguided, the performance is like when. Okay, now I want to explain what does the the negative mean. Negative, it means that the relative performance is weaker. The ELO score being on the negative side, it suggests that the relative performance is on the on the weaker uh, weaker side. So it means like uh, it not it not perform good. So from uh, from here, from unguided, unguided, there wasn't the performance was not good for both the photorealism and the caption. The unguided performance was not good, but when adding club guidance, you can see that the caption performance increased. It became on the positive side of things, but photorealism it still wasn't good. Now, when you added classifier free guidance, the ELO score computed is on the positive side for both of uh, both the photorealism and uh, and caption. So, which suggests that like. Uh, the classifier free guidance itself improved the performance of the photorealism and caption. 
uh, caption by having a ELO scores both on both being on the on the positive uh, side. That's the thing. So I think I'm going to hand over to uh, Rajat for he's going to explain the image in painting. Uh, yeah, um, good, uh, good afternoon. So uh, basically what I am going to tell today is image in painting. So right now, all the presenters, they just said that, okay, we have this magical model and it can take in the text and it can generate an image. But uh, generation is something good, but you want to have some better application for it and which you can actually use in real world. And one of those applications is image in painting. So what is it? Like, what's the problem statement for it? Um, so basically what you have is that you have this RGB image and what you want to, what you want to be able to do is something very simple. So on this image, let's say that you are a user. So you will mark a region in green color. So you mark this region and what you want the network to do is that you want the network to look at this living room, this green colored region, and you want the network to place a painting of a dog on the wall. So when you feed in this text prompt, the RGB image, along with this green colored mask, uh, you feed it through the diffusion process. It go goes through all that forward and reverse diffusion process. And what you end up with is actually the dog painting being placed on the wall. So this is like one iteration of scene editing. Uh, and then what you do is that you mark some other green region and you say that, hey man, you should place a coffee table here. And that you again give this input to the model. And again, what you have is basically the coffee table presented here. Uh, and then on top of the coffee table, you say uh, to the model that maybe you place a flower, you place a flower, uh, a flower on this, a vase of flowers, the model is able to place that. And finally, what you have is that you look at the corner of the screen you, you mark the corner of the image and what you do is that you say that I want to move this sofa into the corner, the couch in the corner. And basically what the network does is that it constructs an additional window on the side of the screen, on the, on the end of the room. So the intersection of two windows is actually a corner. So you can see that earlier there were two windows here, but now it has moved that one of those windows to the other part and it has extended one of the windows span. So it seems that it already has this intelligence. And if you are able to give it such clever inputs and make some changes to the naive glide model, it can perform this useful task. So uh, in this case, what your image input is like this RGB image, which is the image of the living room, the mask, the mask is this green colored mask, which you have manually drawn. And the guiding text is whatever scene element you want the model to place in the image. And what the output is basically you get a new image and this process is actually iterative in nature. So that's the problem statement. And the next thing is like, how will you go about it? Like, how do you actually try to build this into a machine? So uh, what the existing methods did is that they look at this RGB image. So you have this RGB image, you mark this, you mark this green colored region, and now you want to change this green colored region on the basis of text. So what you do is that you start adding Gaussian noise to this region and you gradually refine it. So what happens is that as you keep on refining it, what you see is that the network is able to generate something realistic in the narrow region where you added the Gaussian noise. But this has an issue. What the issue is that if you look at the three quarters, so if you look at these three portions of the image and you look at the fourth portion of the image, there is a pretty large difference. Like, although the thing inside is realistic, but if you look at the transition between the two, there is a sudden shift. So this thing is actually known in the literature uh, as a very fundamental thing, which is actually known as a checkerboard artifact. And you don't want that because that's the issue. And, um, so what you want the network to actually understand is that there is a dog, there is a dog present in this region and there is a sofa present in this region and all these things. So basically you want the network to look at the surrounding context during training. But right now in this method, what you're just doing is you're adding the noise to the 
mask region, which is the green region, and you are not caring about the global context. And that's why it led to this checkerboard artifact in the earlier methods. So uh, what you do, so what I'm going to show is a very simple thing that how you make the changes to the simple glide model and uh, how can you get it working? So this is your naive glide model, right? Which Mohammed and Chandra, everyone explained that you have this image, this noisy image, and it has the textual prompt as input, you feed it to a new net and you get a denoised version. So now you want to modify this network for performing the task of semantic image in painting. And I have partitioned it into two parts. So this is what you do during the training. So during the training, what you have is actually the MS Coco data set. So this part is known. So you know that this is the image and this is the piece of text which describes that image. That's the only annotation you have. So what you do is that you, you, you basically tell the network to perform a synthetic task. What is the task? The task is that, hey, I have this image and if I crop a random region from it, which in this case is a black region, can you reconstruct this image back? So that's the basic question you are trying to ask the network. The way you are doing is because you have this image, you can crop it. So since you have cropped this, what you do is that you crop this and this is the region you crop. So you construct another attention map where the region you crop is actually marked as white and the remaining things are marked as black. So to the unit, what you do is that earlier the unit was only having this noised image as input and this text prompt as input, but now it has two additional inputs. One is this RGB image, which has been cropped. So three more channels and our attention map. So which is one more channel. So you are stacking all these four channels, additional four channels, and all you need to make to the unit, the change is in the first layer, just increase the number of input channels by four. And what you do is that you can, during the training process, you can create these random crops and you can ask the network to try to generate this global context. And this is the training process. During the inference, it's pretty easy. What you do, so during the inference, you don't know this. During the inference, you don't know what it, you will produce, right? But what you have is that, for example, there is some image from which you want to start. So that's your image from which you want to make the edits. You, you, you basically mark a region on it, right? That's what the user does. And you can construct an attention map on this. So this attention map is trivial because you already know the region which the user marked. And you are starting from a noisy image. So what the network does is that it actually replaces this uh, region, which the user selected with the couch in the corner of the room. So this is the only change. And this is how you can modify the naive client model, which is for unconditional text to image generation for semantic image uh, in painting. So, yeah. So uh, coming on to that, like uh, I have some conclusions and future work like uh, there are certain things which I feel could be improved. So the one key takeaway about this paper is that uh, classifier free guidance is actually better than clip guidance. And that's what all the graphs were showing. And that's actually pretty surprising. And it's interesting because we have this clip model, which OpenAI trained on this image text pairs. So we feel that if we have a common space where image and text representations are close together, then you should be able to achieve a better guidance. But it's surprisingly like, uh, it's interesting to see that we don't need such hardcore engineering and a simple classifier free approach is actually working better. The other thing is the diffusion models have one thing which GANs don't have. So in GANs, all you have is the ability to sample from this noise. So the images which you generate are actually photorealistic. Like they are pretty nice looking, but no diversity. But if you look at the diffusion models, what they have is instead of that, they have this continuous scale along with which you can vary this scale guidance parameter. So on scale zero, what you have is a very diverse image. And when you increase the scale guidance, you have this photorealism. So it allows you to basically as a user to iterate that scale vector and to actually, uh, actually choose the diversity and photorealism uh, trade-off, whichever is okay for you as a user. So uh, this is the biggest problem for me right now, actually, like, which seems to me is that the diffusion is iterative. So for example, that uh, in this figure, uh, which I showed earlier, so um, here I wanted to start from this image and finally I wanted this image. 
so i wanted the painting of dog to be placed the couch to be added and all these things right but to do that i had to give this uh, three pairs of text inputs at a regular interval of order and that's something which is very hand engineered we won't, we don't want that we want the ability to just specify in a single shot that these are all the elements we want in the scene and it should be able to place it directly but that's the ability which the networks don't appear to have right now and it is interesting to think that they might be able to do so in future so uh, yeah we are we thank some of the amazing authors who helped uh, to motivate this work and uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to us today